So we're going to cover the first lesson of this unit, which is focusing on exponential and logarithmic functions. And I'm really hesitant to uh, say the title of the unit because that really gives away um, what we're going to cover in this lesson. But anyways, uh, here we're going to talk about the inverse of the exponential function. So before we uh, go forward in this lesson, I need to go over two things, which is uh, what is an exponential function and what is the big idea of inverse? All right, so I have a very basic function, basic linear function here, f of x equals 2x minus 3, and I'm just going to take the inverse of that, or find the inverse of that function. f of x equals 2x minus 3. The first step is replace f of x with y, and then I'm going to interchange x and y, and then solve for the new y, because we prefer to uh, express our uh, express y explicitly so y in terms of x so x plus 3 equals 2y so uh, y equals x plus 3 over 2 and then we slow down we ask ourselves uh, y equals x plus 3 all over 2 is that a function if it is a function then we can use function notation uh, so look at it closely, and the answer is yes, it is a function. So we're going to use function notation. So this is the inverse of f. So what that means is that these two functions, f of x and inverse f of x, these undo one another. Okay, so you can imagine this machine uh, takes x, multiplies it by 2, and subtract by 3 and then spits out some number. Well, the inverse adds by three and then divides by two and then it'll spit you out a new number. So if you look at the two, they really undo each other. So times two minus three, plus three divide two. So this machine or this function, this inverse function brings you back to the beginning. Okay, if you can think of this as uh, a forward progress, well, this will bring you back to the very beginning. So that's the idea of inverse, and that's one of the things we have studied in uh, 11U. Okay, so something else that you did in 11U, exponential functions. So the equation of exponential functions have a general form of f of x equals b to the x. Okay, so it makes sense to call this function an exponential function because look at where the variable is. The variable is where the exponent is located. So f of x equals b to the x. And if you recall what you learned last year with exponential functions, you have two different shapes for an exponential function. You have the one that shoots up, and then you want to have you have the one that basically um, shoot. I don't want to say shoot down, but it it becomes asymptotic very quickly. Okay, so. If you remember, this one is called exponential growth, and this one is called exponential decay. Now, if you know the b in f of x equals b to the x, then you can tell if it's exponential growth or exponential decay, actually. So if b happens to be between 0 and 1, this graph will be an example of exponential decay. And if b is greater than 1, then the graph will be an example of exponential growth okay so 2 to the x well b is greater than 1 so it makes sense for the graph to shoot up to, to have a, a graph of exponential growth and since here b is 1 half then it also makes sense that this graph looks like an exponential decay graph okay so I just want to mention that there are restrictions on what b can be and you can actually even see it um, because if b happens to be between 0 and 1, it's exponential decay. And if b is greater than 1, it's exponential growth. Well, what about b to be 1? What if b is 1? Well, b cannot be 1 because if you have b to be 1, you have 1 to the x, and you won't get this beautiful exponential growth graph or exponential decay graph. In fact, if b was 1, you have 1 to the x, which is just 1, and you'll have a horizontal line. And we don't want to work with that scenario when we study exponential functions. Now, what else do we not allow? We don't allow b to be negative because if b were to be negative, you'll have 
uh, f of x will be undefined for many, many, many different values of x. So because we want, once again, we want this beautiful exponential growth of decay, we do not let b equal 1 or a negative value. Um, if you have doubts about why we don't let b to be negative, you can try to punch, in, punch this in your calculator. Uh, let's say negative, oops, I made a typo here. Let's say uh, negative half, or just even one half would have been fine, but whatever, we'll just do negative one half. Right, if f of x was negative three to the x, then f of negative one half would be negative three to the power of negative one half, and uh, this would be undefined. So this is a reason why we do not let x do not let b be a negative value because many there are many cases where it's undefined or f of x is undefined. So I'm just going to write down the restriction on b here. B cannot be one and b has to be greater than zero. The reason why I want to go over this idea that you learned in 11u b is because we're going to study the inverse of a, of an exponential function. I'm going to give it away. The inverse of an exponential function is what we're, what our big focus is uh, for this coming unit, which are logarithmic functions. And if you recall the properties of exponential functions very well, then your understanding of logarithmic functions will be very strong because they're, they're, they're inverse of each other. Uh, so these ideas here will translate uh, to logarithmic functions very nicely. All right, so let's see. So we have uh, some properties that I want you to fill in for an exponential growth function, exponential decay function. So we, you already have the graph from the first page and uh, what you can do is just pause the video and just fill in the table yourself. Okay, so let's fill this in. Hopefully you have the exact same uh, values as I do. So domain for exponential growth and decay, all real numbers. So this made studying exponential growth and the, or exponential functions in general very easy uh, because the domain was all real numbers. Um, so no restrictions, very straightforward. For the range, it's greater than zero. Y is greater than zero. So Y is greater than zero, what can we say? That means there are no x-intercepts, okay? Uh, intervals of increase, intervals of decrease. So increase means as you go from left to right, the graph is going up. So exponential growth is always increasing. Decreasing, exponential growth is never decreasing. And vice versa. So exponential decay is never increasing. And exponential decay is always decreasing. Uh, relationships between first differences. So this is common between both exponential growth and exponential decay. So there's a common ratio between successive first differences. There's a common ratio between successive first differences, if it is exponential growth or exponential decay. So I'll just write that down one more time. Okay, so for exponential growth and decay, there's a horizontal asymptote of y equals zero. Okay, and these can change uh, if you were to transform the exponential function, which is something, once again, you did in grade 11. All right, so inverse of an exponential function. So now this is the big focus of today's le uh, lesson. So we reviewed what uh, it means to be inverse of a function and what is an exponential function. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna work with the inverse of an exponential function. So this is y equals two to the x, okay? Uh, I just wanna go over that one idea very quickly. 
I'm just gonna find the first differences. You don't have to do this, but I want you to find the first differences for yourself. Okay, so here's eight, this is four, two, one, half, one quarter, one half, one quarter. Oops, one eighth. One eighth, one sixteenth. Okay, sorry about that. So you can tell from the first differences that this relationship is indeed exponential. This table uh, re represents an exponential relationship because I solve for the first differences. They are clearly not common, which means it's not a linear relationship. Uh, I didn't find the second differences, and you can do that by yourself, but I'll assure you that the second differences are not, are not constant, so it's not quadratic. But how do I prove that it's, it's an exponential relationship? So there's a common ratio between these successive first differences. So to go from 1 16th to 1 8th, you can multiply by 2. 1 8th to 1 quarter, multiply by 2. Multiply by 2. So that's what I mean by a common ratio between successive first differences. Okay, so this common ratio proves that this table was in an exponential relationship. Okay, anyways, back to uh, the big idea of the lesson. I have a table here uh, that represents an exponential relationship, and then I took the inverse. So that was very easy to do because we learned that uh, for an inverse, x becomes y and y becomes x. Or you can think of it as domain becomes range and range becomes domain. So either way, you're going to get this table. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, look at the graph of the inverse of an exponential function. Okay. And this is one of our graphs. So this graph is obviously our exponential decay function. Okay. Or you can just think of it as our exponential function. When we take the inverse, this is the inverse of the exponential decay function. So take your time, look at it for a few minutes. You need to memorize how this graph looks. Okay, this is how the graph, how the inverse of an exponential decay function looks. Okay, and then here you also have to memorize this one. This is how the exponential growth function looks. And this is how the inverse of an exponential growth function looks. Okay, now because we're going to be working with, and I'm just going to spoil it for you, this is called a logarithmic function. Because we're working with logarithmic functions um, for quite a, quite a while, it's very important that you, you really know how this graph looks. Every time we ask you to, to ask you to learn a new function, it's imperative that you Give yourself a visual so it really helps you answer a lot of the questions of the unit so i'm going to, I'm going to tell you right away you should know how the graph of a logarithmic function looks like uh, just like how you learn how the sine function looks like when you study trig and you, you learn how the quadratic function looks like when you study quadratics so now it's time to study logarithmic functions and you need to memorize how these graphs look okay so to help you remember we're going to go over the properties of a logarithmic function. So is it inverse of exponential growth, inverse of exponential decay? They're logarithmic functions. Okay, that's the surprise I really didn't want to ruin. But by giving you the title of the unit, that already tells you everything. Okay, so this table will talk about the properties of, an, of a logarithmic function. So domain, well, you know what? You don't even need to memorize this stuff. And if you can't remember the graph, it's okay. Because domain, when you ask, when you think about the domain of a logarithmic function, just think back to the range of a, a range of the exponential function, right? Because they're inverses of each other. So I'm thinking, what is the range? What is the range of an exponential function? That's going to tell me the domain of an exp, uh, of the logarithmic function. So if you look back at it, uh, values has to be greater than zero. So that's the new domain. 
So for these two cells, I'm thinking range of exponential function. For these two cells, for the range of the logarithmic function, I'm thinking what is the domain of my exponential function? And the domain of my exponential function is real numbers, so the range is all real numbers. So it's really beneficial if you refresh your memory on exponential functions. Intervals of increase, intervals of decrease. Well, this one, you can just look at the graph. Okay, so if your exponential growth is actually increasing when it, for, for all values where it's defined, okay? So greater than zero, okay? Because that's a domain, greater than zero, um, and it's never decreasing. I'll show you the graph in a second. So for an inverse of an exponential decay, it's never increasing and decreasing over its entire domain. Once again, the domain is greater than zero. Asymptotes, okay. So really think back to your exponential function. Your exponential function had a horizontal asymptote on the axis. So if you take the inverse, now you no longer have a horizontal asymptote. Now you have a vertical asymptote. Okay, so you have a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. And it makes sense because you want the two graphs to be symmetrical about the y equals x line. So you're going to get, no, you no longer have your, your horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. You're going to have a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. Okay, so I'm going to just show you the graphs really quickly. So this is the exponential growth something that you're really good at and this is the inverse of the exponential growth now, i chose a base of two but really uh, as long as the b value is greater than one then you have a graph that looks somewhat similar and this graph is exponential decay which you're very good at hopefully and this is the inverse of an exponential decay which is a logarithmic function okay so that's the the first lesson hopefully uh, you can re refer to your knowledge that uh, you learned in grade 11, and hopefully that's, that's going to help you uh, help build and learn the new uh, function of the course, which is logarithmic functions.